morning, everyone. Welcome to the public hearing. Good morning. This is the City Planning Commission public meeting held in Spectre Hall, 22 Reed Street. Today is Wednesday, January 8, 2014. As a courtesy during the proceedings, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones and beepers. All speakers should fill out a speaker's card at the desk outside of Spectre Hall. In addition, we ask that those providing testimony, please identify yourself, limit your remarks to three minutes, and speak clearly into the microphone. I will now call the roll. <coughs> Vice Chair Knuckles. Here. Commissioner Battaglia. Here. Commissioner Besser. Here. Commissioner Cantor. Here. Commissioner Cerullo. Here. Commissioner Chen. Commissioner De La Uz. Here. <coughs> Commissioner Del Turo. Here. Commissioner Dweck. Commissioner Edie. Here. Commissioner Levin. Here. Commissioner Marin. A quorum is present. <coughs> the first item is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of Wednesday, December 18, 2013. On the minutes, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? The minutes are approved. <coughs> Excuse me. Scheduling on calendar numbers 1 through 16, we have resolutions for adoption. Scheduling January 22nd, 2014 for a public hearing to be held in Spectre Hall, 22 Reed Street. <coughs> on the resolutions, all in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? The resolutions are adopted. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page 19. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number 17, CD5, N140214, PXX. In the matter of a notice of intent to acquire office space for use of property located at 1775 Grand Concord. For a favorable report on calendar number 17, Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Battaglia? Yes. Commissioner Bessa? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Chen? Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Del Turo? Yes. Commissioner Edie. Thank you. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marin. Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 17. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number 18, CD 11, C110342, MMX. In the matter of an application for an amendment to the city map concerning the Ponton Avenue city map amendment. For a favorable report on calendar number 18, Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Battaglia? Yes. Commissioner Bessa? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Chen? Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Del Turo? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 18. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number 19, CD 16, C140, 115, HAK. In a matter of an application for a UDAP designation and disposition of property concerning the Bergen Saratoga apartments. For a favorable report on calendar number 19, Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Battaglia. Always happy to vote yes on affordable housing development. In this case, 80 units in Brooklyn. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Bessa? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Chen? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Happy to vote yes. Commissioner Del Turo? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 19. <clears throat> Borough of Queens, calendar numbers 20 and 21. Calendar number 20, CD 12, C070194, ZMQ. Calendar number 21, C090033, MMQ. In the matter of applications for amendments of the zoning map and the city map concerning the North Conduit Avenue rezoning. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 20 and 21. Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Battaglia? I certainly think the applicant in this case uh, performed due diligence in indicating to us that the intended use will be the actual use and showing that the community does support this, and I vote yes. Commissioner Besser? Yes. <coughs> Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Chen? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Del Turo? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 20 and 21. Borough of Queens, calendar number 22, CD2, N140215, PXQ. In a matter of a notice of intent to acquire office space for use of property located at 31-0047th Avenue. For a favorable report on calendar number 22. 
Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Battaglia? Yes. Commissioner Bessa? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Chen? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Del Turo? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 22. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 23, CD3, N140082, RCR, in a matter of an, an application for the grant of a certification concerning 5301 Amboy Road. For adoption on calendar number 23, <coughs> Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Battaglia? Yes. Commissioner Bessa? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Chen? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Del Turo? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. <coughs> Commissioner Marin? Yes. Calendar number 23 has been adopted. <laughs> Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 24, CD3, N140-121-RCR, in a matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 220 Edge Grove Avenue. For adoption on calendar number 24, Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Battaglia? Yes. Commissioner Bessa? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. <coughs> Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Chen? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Del Turo? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Calendar number 24 has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 25, CD3, N130396, RCR. In a matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 541 and 537 Wilson Avenue. For adoption on calendar number 25, Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Battaglia? Yes. Commissioner Besser? Yes. Commissioner Cantor? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Chen? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Del Turo? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Calendar number 25 has been adopted. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page 24. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number 26, CD6, C140089, PPX. A public hearing in the matter of an application for the disposition of two city-owned properties. Okay, our first speaker, perhaps our only speaker, is Chris Grove, DCAS. Good morning, Vice Chairman and members of the City Planning Commission. I am Chris Grove, Senior Planner of Asset Management at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss DCAS's ULERP application for the disposition of two city-owned properties in Bronx Community Board 6. Uh, the first property is Block 3055, Lot 8, also known as um, 2374 Bathgate Avenue. Um, the city acquired this building um, in 1943, and it contains a two-story unoccupied former, or I shouldn't say former, uh, it's just not, it's vacant right now. It's still under sanitation uh, control. Located uh, building that's located in Belmont neighborhood of the Bronx. Um, the other property is um, a small sliver property uh, that's vacant as well. Uh, the city acquired it in 1975 in in-rem foreclosure. Um, in regards to the building, the building was a former uh, section station, which was like a, a dormitory building where uh, sanitation um, employees would go to change, and then they would wait for the trucks to pick them up. Um, they have no use for it anymore, and so we're here to seek disposition approval for both properties. Um, I'm here to answer any questions if you have any. Well, I think the obvious question is uh, with regard to the second, uh, you, you describe it as a slither. Yes. Uh, it's 27 square feet, is that it? That's correct. Um, it's roughly <laughs> right about here. Right about here. <laughs> I'm tempted to ask how did, uh, it, how did it become a problem, but uh, I think the greater question is uh, the process by which DCAS uh, will allow the adjacent property owner, uh, the property owner of the building uh, next to the parcel, to uh, acquire it, uh, i.e. a sole source. Is that underway? 
Well, it's, uh, nothing is underway at this time. Um, what we had done is uh, a few years back, um, we had got um, uh, state enabling legislation to permit us to make some direct sales because TCAS is not allowed to make direct sales up to this point. Um, and it was only for small properties that are undevelopable on their own. Um, DCAS has, is the keeper of surplus city-owned property. I'm aware of that. And uh, I'm sure you are. <laughs> and uh, there's been a lot of um, errors that have happened, uh, severe errors I mean, over the years. And we assume that this is probably what had happened um, in this instance. Um, so what happens is that we don't seek any of the – we don't solicit until we have disposition approval. Right. We don't want to build hopes up until we have, uh, you know, the authorization. Um, once we do, we can reach out and send them a letter and ask them if they have interest. And I don't know if they will or they won't. Do um, you know they, who the owner is? Do you know the owner of the, the identity? We do. We do know who the owner is. I don't know. On, on, I don't have the person's name here on me right at this moment. But we do know who the, the owner is. And um, we will solicit and uh, see if they have interest and. <coughs> You know, 27 square feet, I'm sure, is not going to be a very expensive uh, piece of property to, Better not to, uh, <laughs> um, anyway. What's, what's, so, what's behind, what's behind, the 27 square feet is in front of that gate, right? It's a, it's adjacent to the property. What's behind the gate? This gate is, um, I, I think it's a, there's a school over here to the side. Yeah. Um, that's where I call, right? And it's just like the yard area. This particular property is really only adjacent to that private-owned property, so mm -hmm. they're the only ones that will benefit. If they do not want the property anymore, they'll just stay in DCAS's inventory. It just gives us an opportunity to, to try and get it out of our DCAS's inventory, and if they have a benefit, then they will. And what we're doing is if there's a, an anchor building such as – or anchor property, and we're Europeing that, if we have anything else in our inventory – we're going to include that into our um, application, and that that's the only other one that's not ULIP approved that we feel is worthy. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Grove? Uh, Commissioner Battaglia. Good morning. <coughs> I, it may very well be the same question, but okay. it's a little more specific. The sale away program, does that still exist? It does. Um, that's, and that's, that's what you're describing. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's part of uh, the city charter that's been changed. So and that, that would we can be any adjacent property owner, front, back, side? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> and yeah, as long as it's not like a tiny corner or something like that. But yeah, if it's if it's in between, we will offer it. Both. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I just wanted to ask um, whether anyone's expressed any interest in the sanitation garage. No one. Okay, so you'll just put it out there and see what happens. Yeah. Will Will, will you actively market it? In in the sense for the, for all our auction properties, we we do. Um, I mean, if another agency. Uh, approaches us, we will also consider that as well. It's still under sanitation's control, but we're anticipating that it will be in our inventory soon. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner, welcome. Has, has a review been done regarding the second parcel? Has a review been done of the survey to make sure that it's not just an error and that there is technically a real lot there? Um, there may not have been some surveying error that created it by accident as opposed to... Unfortunately, no. I, I, I We haven't done any any due diligence in that sense of trying to figure out how that happened. Um, we do have a, a lot of these properties in our inventory. and um, I mean, that's kind of our main conclusion of why we think it's, it's, it's happened, um, that some of these properties were done in the 50s and 60s or earlier than that, and some mistakes have been made. Um, I mean, if usually if it's bigger than a little triangle, and it, you know, than 27 feet, then there's usually a story to it right. of some sort. Right. I mean, it might be an easy way to, you know, by reviewing the documents and fixing the error, so to speak, mm -hmm. it might be an easy way to just hand it back to the owner as opposed to going through a more elaborate process. Just a thought. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Other questions? Great. Hey, Chris. Funny you should bring up a little triangle. I mean, compared to the one in Staten Island in the driveway, this is a... Huge, <laughs> this is a huge soft site. <laughs> um, just a question, just based on the photograph. Yes. So, so the the twenty seven square feet is next to the fence. That's part of the school. Yeah, right? it's probably closer to the stoop. 
probably it's, about right there. Area. It's just right there. It is. <laughs> so if it becomes so, then from that point on, the sidewalk would be city owned. Is mm -hmm. that right? So That's it would correct. be an invisible line for a private owner to have ownership of. Okay. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I, I would say that's right. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out if it's at this, will it bring it to the stoop so that the line is, but, but you're coming beyond the stoop. And I don't think it's beyond some the point, stoop. The I think it's, it's, it's right next to the stoop. Um, so it, it, it's not in part of the better street in any way. Right. It's not part of the sidewalk. It is a lot of property that's next to, um, sorry, lot, lot eight. Okay, and how long is this fence? Is lot eight, sorry. So how how much, what's the length of the fence? So between the stoop line and even the this piece of parcel, what would be the next thing you would, if you were walking so toward all, us? So all of this right here, yes. I don't know. I, I see. Yeah. So all of this from the corner on is like a yard. It's the yard. Yeah, and so this is like the fence here showing that, and it's a schoolyard of some sort. And the triangle is actually next to this, this stoop right here, but not into the street. Understood, but it would be on the, it's sort of in the sidewalk, so to speak. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, it is. So we even notice it. I mean, there's no... Right, that's what I, and I guess that's my question, and I have no objection to this, yeah. but I just wonder why it isn't cleaner it to just make it part of this, you know, to keep it in, not that DCAS would take jurisdiction over it, perhaps, but that DOT would become part of the sidewalk system which would be cleaner than a private owner ending up with this triangle sure. I, because it's not expanding the property of a private owner in some way. It's a, a very unique kind of situation. We have a unique um, inventory, um, um, to say the least. And um, we have had properties that have been also lotted in, in the beds of street. And, and over the years, we have asked DOT to review those properties, and yeah. we have had some success in that. So we have actually moved a lot of that property over to DOT, which makes yeah. a lot of sense because they take care of streets and DCAS, even though we may have taken a property in REM somehow, um, you know, that it, they can continue to pave it and fix it. Sure. Um, in this instance, it's just, you know, it's a little bit of an... an Anomaly that's not really in the bed of the street, so I don't know if DOT will take it. Yeah. But if the adjacent owner, this this particular private owner, takes it, we would encourage them to incorporate it into their mm -hmm. existing lot, their where the building is at, should I say? And that's what we yeah. usually do. We hope that that's sure. what they do. And and I understand that usually they're more we're calling this adjacent to, mm -hmm. but it's sort of <coughs> sticking out from. And yes. It's not the same, you know, you're expanding your property line by an extra five feet. This is sort of, to the public's eye, mm -hmm. the sidewalk. Yeah. Um, for liability purposes, if this were transferred to a private owner or acquired by a private owner, they would be legally responsible for this patch mm -hmm. in the middle of what looks like the public sidewalk where there's a lot of confusion. Or they would stick something, p perhaps legally, in the middle of what looks like a public sidewalk, you know, pla a planter or something. Sure. So it's just, a, it's an interesting thing, and I just wondered why it wasn't, uh, just it, just in terms of dealing with the, a sister agency, perhaps, that it might have been easier to make it part of just to turn it into a sidewalk and part of the sidewalk and take it out of DCAS's yeah. portfolio, which clearly makes sense. Um, but I guess we'll see how it goes once the disposition is provided, then I guess any kind of conversation could take place at that point. Yes. I mean, and, you know, maybe the plan B will to see if DOT will take it. It, it might not be within their realm because if it's not in the better street itself, even though it might look like right. a sidewalk, you know. Yeah, interesting. So. It's, it'll be interesting to follow this one. <laughs> There's not a curb cut by chance. In, uh, no, uh, is there? there isn't. <coughs> okay. Not to my, my recollection. There wasn't right there, no. Okay. Just an observation. Uh, uh, yes. If this, if this doesn't work out, I have a Russian bitter. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that was... A, unfortunately, <laughs> Sailway has a... You have to be adjacent to it. <laughs> I'm sure that was said in jest. Yes, um, I know it was. 
Yes. Uh, any other questions on this uh, nettlesome matter? Thank you, Mr. Grove. Thank you. Are there any other uh, speakers on this item? Any other speakers on this item? Okay. Then this hearing is closed. Okay. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number 27, CD1. N140099ZRK, a public hearing in the matter of an application for an amendment of the zoning resolution concerning the East River Tax Amendment. Audio Dasco. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Happy New Year. My name is Hardy Adasco, Senior Vice President at the Economic Development Corporation. I'm here to explain the East River Ferry item and answer your questions. In June 2011, the East River Ferry Service was established as a three-year pilot program. This commercial ferry service had to overcome major obstacles in the existing zoning regulations, and these were accomplished through a cumbersome process of special permits and temporary zoning, uh, mayoral zoning overrides. The program has been extremely successful. We anticipated approximately 4,000 riders in the first year, and in the first 13 months, we served over a million uh, passengers. To date, more than 2.9 million passengers, uh, paid passengers, have, ri- have traveled the ferry. In just two and a half years, the ferry has become an integral part of the city's transportation infrastructure, improving transit connections between emerging waterfront neighborhoods in Brooklyn and Queens, and actually between them is the most interesting item. It's not just uh, to service to Manhattan. Um, enhancing mobility in New York City Harbor for residents and visitors, increasing flexibility for emergency transportation services. Uh, we uh, reestablished ferry service after uh, Sandy uh, much, much quicker than uh, several other transportation services, and supporting the ongoing reactivation of much of the East River waterfront. Based on the success, the EDC issued a request for proposals and recently signed a contract to continue the East River Ferry Service for a minimum of five years. With the extensive assistance of city planning staff in zoning, urban design, and waterfront planning, a set of regulations and a certification process to control future sites and the continuation of the existing sites is proposed and before you. Chris Hayner has actually uh, explained this to you in uh, better detail than I could possibly accomplish. Uh, Throughout the pilot period, EDC conducted passenger surveys, and these yielded extensive information about riders' habits. This information has provided a firm fact basis uh, for the proposed regulations. And the proposed regulations are designed to balance and remove conflict between waterfront access areas and waterfront access areas, between the transportation function and the quiet enjoyment of the waterfront area. Uh, The regulations establish queuing areas, uh, requirements for trash receptacles and bicycle racks, and they define uh, the parameters of shelter and ticketing ticketing facilities. They address parking and drop-off requirements. Certification applications are ready to go for three sites upon text approval. We believe that the zoning text changes before you today establish clear standards and an efficient regulatory environment for ferries in Brooklyn Community Board 1. There are also a framework which may uh, in the future be expanded to other areas. We are pleased that Brooklyn Community Board 1 and the Borough President support these regulations, which will allow EDC to continue uh, this important transportation option. We hope the Commission will also support them. I'm happy to answer any questions. Hardy, you said the projection uh, for the first year, was that a... a, a, Yes. 4,000? 400,000. 400,000? Yes. Oh, okay. More than doubled it. Uh, and it turned into a million. The demand was a million rather than... Yes. Okay. Uh, questions for Hardy? Anna? Um, yes, Hardy, I guess you, you heard one of my questions on um, uh, Monday. But before we get to that, just as a sidebar, um, I'm pleased to hear... I think it's... Obviously, this is a great thing to encourage. Um, and I think you indicated that the city had recently signed a contract to uh, continue this for another five years. How much um, city subsidy is, is the city have continue to have to subsidize this or is the, is the, the thing um, uh, economically standing on its own? It now? is, even with the much higher numbers, it uh, um, still needs subsidy. The subsidy levels are approximately what they've been during the pilot uh, uh, program and uh, um, 
Is there a break-even level that we might get to? Um, or do we need I to can't answer that. I, 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 that. I don't know. Um, probably not in that uh, the, the boats have limited capacity. Uh, on the weekends, we're using 400. Uh, uh, 399 weekdays 150 um, and weekends where in the prime time we're hitting capacity uh, and uh, uh, weekdays there's probably room for some more people on the boats I don't know if it's in the most prime time so um, once you start getting more people you start needing more boats more frequent uh, uh, turnaround that started to add adds expenses one two three uh, employees per boat for 400 people, for 150 people. But the subsidy levels are lower than certain other transportation subsidies, including express buses and, and others. So, uh. um, so turning to this application, um, the, between them, the community board and the borough president, I think essentially highlighted two operational issues. Um, one with respect to lighting. Um, and the other about informational signage, um, who to call if there's a problem. And then from that who to call comes the who's going to receive the calls and who's going to respond to any issues. Okay. Could you speak to those two? In things? terms of lighting, um, <coughs> the, and, and this goes to the operational uh, issue also, um, the actual ferry landing, the, the dock area, um, is under city control and and <coughs> as part of our contract and the subsidy cash flow uh, is is in our agreement with the ferry operator and that is is working at the lighting standards that are uh, that are discussed uh, so 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 that's one between the that ferry landing and the street there are a variety of different property situations. Uh, we have uh, City Parks Department, we have uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park, we have a condo association responsibility, we have uh, city land, we have an easement, uh, we have some things that are that have been built under current waterfront uh, uh, access regulations which do have the higher lighting standards. There's one site uh, which was built before the current standards and it met the previous standards but its lighting levels are somewhat lower, and that's a condo association responsibility. So it's a, it's a complex and hybrid system, and in general, uh, it was it was the belief of the staff at the Department of City Planning that working off the waterfront public access standards going forward was the best way to to address it. Uh, and that is the way the, the text addresses it, basically, by not adding anything new. We have, we have underlying zoning, we have waterfront zoning, we have Williamsburg zoning, and now we have additional, and trying to keep it as simple as possible was the goal. Is lighting required on the docks? Yes. I mean, by our operational situation. Okay. But not by this text? No. For the reason that you just explained? Correct. Um, for the other uh, uh, situation in, in terms of informing, it's the same uh, complex situation, hybrid situation, um, and, and because of all those permutations, uh, we've also made it simple in that we have established a sign at each facility that gives the contact information for the ferry operator, and the ferry operator uh, working with EDC will sort it out whether they have to do it or Parks Department or somebody else. They have different arrangements with the upland property owners. Uh, more, and, and that will be done quickly. More generally, we have a weekly management meeting with them and, and in terms of dealing with things systematically, we do that on a very frequent, regular basis. And the, them in that case is the operator? Uh, it, the EDC and the, and the operator? Correct. Uh, well, also including other agencies as, as appropriate. But we've, we're not trying to have everybody figure out this complexity. We have one phone number. That's who they call. Okay. But there is a consistent enforcement, monitoring, pragmatic, problem-solving yes. component to EDC's management yes. of contracts. Yes. Other questions for Hardy, Michelle? Hi. Thanks for being here. Um, Kind of following up on a, another point that was made by the borough president specific to um, working with applicants about uh, shelters 
for queuing areas um, prior to the filing of a docking facility application. Can you just speak to that and how that process works and whether or not that's something that's covered in the operating agreement? Again, the, the um, uh, three in community board, uh, uh, one that we're predominantly talking about that are the effect of the zoning, all have shelters. Uh, and, um, and it was felt that the important thing in terms of the public interest was uh, to set up parameters for the design of the shelters to make sure that they were not too big and they did not overwhelm the public access area. Um, and, and because of the variety of physical situations that may come up in the future, to not require shelters. Uh, as I say, the three that we're operating have shelters, uh, and uh, we anticipate that uh, any, any other applications will most likely want shelters, and this set establishes the parameters of where they can be, that they don't conf conflict, and what their design is like. And the design, uh, would that be the uh, subject of a review by the Public Design uh, Commission? Uh, probably not, but again, again, it depends where they are vis-a-vis -vis the uh, um, public property versus private property, and, and it's only public property that would be reviewed by the uh, Public Design Commission. Do you envision uh, the shelters, however, being uniform in, in design, which is to say that the, the one you have the, the same sta on uh, North th This establishes relatively uh, uh, explicit standards on them. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they'll be exactly the same, but the, the, the text is very explicit. Good morning, Hardy. I understand this uh, deals with the locations in Community Board 1. There are two additional locations um, outside of Manhattan where there's ferry landing um, in Brooklyn and Queens. Why are those not part of this? And um, just explain. They are uh, park properties, or actually the, the one in Long Island City is a park. Parks are exempt from zoning. This is a, a park function that's been defined as, so they don't have zoning requirements. The other one, Brooklyn Bridge Park, is under a zoning override from the Empire State Development Corporation. It's also exempt from zoning and, and so forth. I knew there was a good reason. Thank you. Uh, in Question. terms of operationally setting it up, I would say we got lucky. Uh, but, uh, but I think that these standards would be the kind of things that would be expected uh, in the future. Any other questions for Hardy? Thank you, Hardy. Thank you. Um, okay. The second speaker is Matt. I can't make out the, the uh, last name. Don't want to mispronounce it. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. My name is uh, Matt Ojala. Um, Communications Director to Council Member Stephen Levin. I'm here on his behalf today and will read his testimony. Okay. Um, as the representative of the 33rd, <clears throat> 33rd Council District in Brooklyn, which includes the North Brooklyn Waterfront from Greenpoint to Pier 6 in Brooklyn Heights, I was thrilled to see the implementation of the East River Ferry Service Pilot Program in 2011. I was even happier to see the program thrive in its early years as Brooklynites chose to forego long subway and bus commutes for the more efficient ferry routes. In its first 13 months, over 1 million riders utilized the East River Ferry, far surpassing the projected ridership of 410,000 riders in the first year. Due, the, due to the popularity of the service, Mayor Bloomberg passed a zoning override in order to accommodate 399 passenger ferries instead of the 99 passenger ferries allowed as of right at the Community Board 1 landings. These landings, located in South Williamsburg, North Williamsburg, and Greenpoint, have proved to be immensely popular with ferry riders. In 2013, 43% of ferry trips originated at one of the three CB1 landings, and over 1.1 million riders have taken the East River Ferry from these landings since the pilot began. The East River Ferry is an essential component of North Brooklyn's transportation infrastructure. With limited subway options and increased residential development, the popularity of the ferry shows no signs of letting up. 
in order to ensure that the larger vessels can continue to dock at Community Board 1 landings without interruption, I urge the Commission to support the zoning tax amendment, amendment before you this morning. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for reading the statement from uh, Council Member 11. Harrison Peck. Morning. I'm um, Harrison Peck. I'm with the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, the MWA is a coalition of, <coughs> excuse me, more than 770 businesses and organizations committed to uh, maximizing our waterfronts and waterways. Uh, after decades of decline in water mass transit across the New York region, recent years have seen New Yorkers and tourists alike returning to their waterways for rapid transportation. And nowhere is this shift in transit preference clearer than aboard the East River Ferry. Though it was launched as a temporary pilot project, the East River Ferry has quickly proven itself to be a game changer for New York City's transit system. It more than doubled its initial ridership projections, serves as critical infrastructure in the days and weeks following Superstorm Sandy, and helped to inject a healthy dose of economic activity along a formerly neglected stretch of waterfront. Given growing demands on transit, the, the increasing frequency and intensity of extreme weather, and the changing nature of waterfront neighborhoods, it is essential that the city nurture expansion to the East River Ferry and enhance its incorporation into upland communities by adopting the proposed ULIP application and codifying permanent service. First of all, the allowance for higher capacity boats is critical to optimizing the benefits of the East River Ferry, both during times of emergency and under normal operations. For instance, in the immediate aftermath of the Northeast blackout, the transit strike, the terrorist attacks, and most recently, Superstorm Sandy, which uh, knocked out some subway lines for a full week and caused congestion on river uh, crossings, ferries were consistently the first mode of transportation to come back online, uh, quickly restoring mobility to otherwise stranded New Yorkers. The greater the transit capacity during times of emergency, the more quickly and fluid fluidly people may reach work, friends, families, and resume their daily routines. Higher capacity boats have also become a necessity during normal operations as well. For proof, one only needs to observe the throngs of passengers disembarking at Schmorgisberg on the sunny weekend afternoon or <clears throat> just the lines running down the length of Pier 11 during the evening rush hour, both in pleasant and inclement weather. Um, in addition to increased capacity, the zoning tax amendments provisions for more seamless integration of East River Ferry infrastructure into upland communities ensure that ferry service will continue to complement and not obstruct the development underway in Greenpoint and Williamsburg. For instance, the elimination of minimum parking requirements for ferry landings will guarantee that highly wa valuable waterfront land can be developed for pedestrian and not automobile benefit, while terminal design guidelines will preserve the waterfront view corridors that contribute to the neighborhood's high land value and appeal. Moreover, the enlarged passenger waiting areas will ensure the accommodation of, ferries, of the ferry's ridership base without interfering with public enjoyment of existing public spaces and amenities. In all these cases, a no-action scenario would deny these important provisions to Community Board 1 and jeopardize long-term development potential. Lastly, given the success of the East River Ferry, transit poor neighborhoods across the five boroughs from Bay Ridge to Roosevelt Island to Soundview in the Bronx are clamoring for their own ferry landings, and the EDC's new re newly released citywide ferry study acknowledges the sound transit planning uh, policy rationale of expanding service to underserved corners in the city. Um, and we hope that this ULIP application serves as a precedent for future ferry landings, and that hopefully not too far off from now, uh, the MWA can return to the Commission to testify on behalf of new terminals as serve New Yorkers with the fewest transit options. Uh, so just to close, if there was ever any question as to the value of ferry service on the East River, uh, the astounding ridership figures and booming East River skyline serve as definitive proof. The proposed ULIP application will ensure that the East River Ferry uh, can stay afloat and function efficiently in perpetuity, sustaining affordable service uh, to an ever-expanding ridership base. The MWA strongly supports this application and hopes that it paves the way for a robust five-borough ferry network. Thank you, Mr. Peck. Questions? Thank you. Are there any other speakers on this item? There are none. Accordingly, the hearing is closed. Bar of Manhattan, calendar number 28, concerning Times Square major concession. This item has been withdrawn. Bar of Queens, calendar number 29, CD8, C120178, ZMQ. A public hearing in the matter of an application for an amendment of the zoning map concerning a Union Turnpike rezoning. Richard Lobel. <coughs>
Good morning, Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel, PC, for the applicant. As the commissioners are aware, the rezoning here, uh, which is bounded by Union Turnpike, 79th Avenue, Parsons Boulevard, and a line for 540 feet east of Parsons Boulevard, is for rezoning from R32 with a small C1 commercial overlay, a C12 commercial overlay along Parsons Boulevard to the rezoning of the site to R5D with a C13 over the entirety of the property. Um, we had many conversations with community stakeholders, with the community <coughs> board, with the both the current uh, council member and former council member, and we're happy to get support for this rezoning, uh, understanding that at the community board it was a spirited discussion and it was um, kind of a close uh, vote, as, as, as it were. Um, Sam Zirk, who's with me today and is available for questions, is a property owner. And the reason that uh, we, when we initially discussed this rezoning, that we felt it was a, a fruitful rezoning was because under the current R32 zoning, this is not a contextual district, and the lot would be able to uh, sustain a building of approximately 10 stories at 98 feet tall. Um, with setbacks, uh, it would create kind of an ugly pyramid-type building, but would be completely legitimate as a medical facility uh, and a community, medical community facility use. The applicant went to the Department of Buildings. We further reviewed the zoning calculations in the office, and, and it is correct that they could put up this building. With the proposed zoning district at an R5D, the applicant can put up a contextual building, a 40-foot tall, four-story building with ground floor commercial and three stories of residential above um, with 39 residential units and um, uh, parking underneath. The applicant and the community board felt that this was an appropriate use of the property. This property is um, undeveloped. It is a vacant lot. It is overgrown. It is unsightly. And the community board really felt overall that this was going to be a productive use for the property. Right now, as a matter of fact, on this block and adjacent to the project site is a medical office building. It's a cornerstone medical facility for anyone familiar with the property. And that is a, a, a five-story building, which is above the current permitted height in the R32. Um, and it's, it shows what can be done with the property. And, and quite frankly, the surrounding area, given the choice between the very real possibility of a medical medical office and medical facility here versus a nice residential building with ground floor commercial felt that it was an appropriate use. Moreover, uh, if you can take a look at that R5D along Union Turnpike, the R5D with the commercial overlay exists for about six blocks on the south of Union Turnpike, and the commercial overlay exists for four blocks on the north. So this really kind of gaps, it bridges a gap of a, of a commercial sec, uh, area. Um, the last thing I'd say is that Sam did go door to door quite amazingly and uh, this map right here, the area map shows in pink the consents that he received from surrounding community members. Um, so there were over 100 consents received, I think it was 102. Uh, as you can see, our properties in yellow, he was able to get a majority of properties on the block, including the adjacent property owners, as well as many of the residential neighbors who came and spoke in support of the community board hearing. So. That's my time, and again, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lobel. We'll go from Commissioner Battaglia and then Commissioner Chen and whomever else. Good morning, Richard. Good morning. As I've consistently said, you're a credit to your dad. It's nice to see you here, and Happy New Year. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I want you to address, I'm sure um, maybe at least one of the other commissioners will ask the same question or possibly, um, why there were so many community board members opposed to this. I, I do want to, I should, should have prefaced my remarks with I certainly think this is a reasonable use. Um, at Monday's review session, it was uh, brought to our attention that there were some traffic concerns. Maybe you could just address what the concerns actually are. Sure. I think that some of the community board concerns surrounded incorrect information. And when we had the land use committee hearing, there were concerns with regards to the legality of the curb cut on Union Turnpike. And there were concerns about traffic. And so, in, and having looked at previous applications before this community board, I saw that in the very few rezonings that had been approved by the community board, that one of the things that was targeted by the community board was a lack of response to the applicant. So 
in November, prior to the full board hearing, we submitted a, an extensive submission which addressed all these issues. Stephen, um, Fry, Stephen Everett from City Planning addressed the curb cut and demonstrated that actually it's a legal existing curb cut and could be continued for that use as a 24 foot wide curb cut. Um, we also addressed traffic and parking issues. We asked um, Sam Schwartz Engineering, who is a you know, well recognized and respected traffic engineering firm, to review this matter and they determined that at the peak hour there would be 40 trips, 20 trips in and 20 trips out and that this would have an immaterial impact on the traffic in the surrounding area. So we really feel that we did a solid job in addressing that. Members of the of the executive committee of the board said that we addressed this to their to their uh, satisfaction and so we're you know we were happy to move forward. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Chen. You know, another, uh, I guess, stream of information we got uh, about the source of the uh, the uh, opposition was on the other side, the opposite side of Union Turnpike, that there was some concern that that R5D had been developed in uh, a fashion that some considered out of context. Could you, do you have a view on that? And uh, There's a, there is a, um, there is a, four-story building across the street um, that is developed with commercial office. Mm -hmm. um, and so people were expressed that um, they felt that they were sensitive to that. And they, they didn't want this to become Queens Boulevard, for example, and a, and a commercial thoroughfare like that. Um, I think that the way we addressed that at the hearing was when we talk about illustrative plans and we present plans to city planning, we talk about the worst case. And so people uh, and the, on the community board, those opposing it said, well, you know, we want to know what the worst case is here. And we basically showed them. And we said, you know, yes, you can have a 40-foot tall building, but the reality of a commercial development here rising to that height is not really uh, feasible here. There's a very limited access. The lot, which is a through lot, has only 50 feet of frontage on Union Turnpike. It has 100 feet of frontage on 79th Avenue. So that the reality here was that for, for commercial purposes, there would be in and out of traffic on that very, on the 24 foot wide curb cut, but that they weren't really, there wasn't really the same concern w with a large commercial presence. Um, and as, in the same way that we show the worst case in what we're proposing, I think really when we show the worst, worst case with what was existing, I really think that that won out. I really, really think that, um, you know, that people recognize that R32 is not a contextual district here, that there was a real risk, which is not something that the owner wanted. It was not something that was even thrown out there as a threat. It was more that, realistically, they had plans, and they went into DOB, and those plans were approved. So while, that, while there was concern regarding that type building type, I think that, at the end of the day, the, the fact that this is contextual went out. Okay. Any other questions for Richard LaBelle? Anna? Um, yes, I have a question about the uh, uh, 40 peak hour trips, sure. which seem like a lot for a project of this scale. Is it just this, is it, is that traffic counts just for this site or does it include the hospital? It was just for this site and the traffic counts were projected on worst case and they were projected on, for example, Right now, we're looking at about 39 to 40 units of one to three bedrooms. Those traffic counts were projected on 69 maximum units, which would include many studios, um, as well as a commercial space. I think that, so I think that they looked at those realistic numbers and this, they gave us the worst. But I think also, what, a very interesting thing to note about traffic is that with a, an as of right community facility, uh, 98 foot tall option, the required parking on that scenario actually creates more than double the number of cars um, which would be accommodated underneath. So again, we were really happy that when this played out, that traffic uh, building type, building size really, really was persuasive as far as the rezoning. Okay, other questions for uh, Richard Lobel? Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Are there any other uh, speakers on this item? There are. Yes. Answer my own question. Anthony Lee. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, 
My name is Anthony. My family has lived in this uh, area about a block away from this property for about 35, 36 years. And um, for, for me, I, I, when I came to this, I looked at the possibility of the um, uh, commercial development of the property because this has been an, a sort of an eyesore for a while in the community. And uh, so my concern was what would be going there. And when I dis dis discovered what was going to be there, it seemed very reasonable. And then would it, my, my biggest concern is my parents are elderly now and I'm kind of taking care of them. <laughs> my biggest concern was that it wouldn't become a commercial district and that this seems a, a, a more reasonable use than some of the other ideas that I had heard thrown around. And so I just wanted to make sure that I at least try to voice the concern that this development not turn into a commercial nightmare that caused the flavor of the community to change. And that's been my biggest concern. And I think that the proposal that's been offered kind of made me feel more comfortable about that idea. And it w I think it maintained the sort of sense of community that we have. So I just wanted to be able to at least voice that. and. They gave me an opportunity to do so. So, so where where do you reside, Mr. Lee? Can eight. you uh, point it out in, uh, in uh, relation to the site? See where the five uh, the R five D is the site. Okay. Okay. It's, it's, I could throw something at the, at the property. So, you know. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Lee? Commissioner. Yeah, I just appreciate your coming and uh, expressing your point of view, but it's pretty unusual that folks come all this way. Um, how did, how, what motivated you to come today? Uh, well, Uh, I, at one point in my recent past, I had a uh, cause to appear before a uh, hearing like this in another state. I was developing a property myself, and uh, I know how important and valuable this interaction is. And my mom got sick, and she's now suffering from Alzheimer's and is in the hospital. And my dad is now a uh, cancer survivor, and he had, can, can't walk that well. So I had to sort of move back from New Jersey um, back home to take care of them and to kind of take over the house. And so my concern is larger than this individual project. It's sort of I'm now going to, I'm tied to the community. Um, I, I hate to say for good, but, yeah, I'm going to be there for a while. So my um, <laughs> desire to become involved in what happens in the community is pretty um, strong. So. Well, thank you. Thanks for taking the time. It's helpful to us. Any other questions for Mr. Lee? Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, here for questions is uh, Shalom Zerkiev. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, I'm uh, the applicant for this site. Just um, if there's any questions. You're the owner of the property? Mr. The owner. Right. Zerkiev? Okay. All right. Questions? For the owner. Michelle. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Um, how long have you owned the property? Uh, since 2009. Okay. And um, I guess you've done a market analysis about the demand for the kinds of uses that you're intending, and you believe you've got a pretty solid plan here because I, I think um, the concern that was expressed by the property owner about um, the potential for overwhelming commercial development seems to be one that's shared. Sure. Um, that's a good question. And uh, regarding commercial development, if we were looking to do commercial development, we would do it as of right. Um, we did have uh, people that wanted to come into the building. And uh, the building that we could do is uh, larger in size and square footage and in height. Um, so if we wanted to do the commercial option, we would do it like, without even going through t two years and spending so much money and so much time in coming to meetings. It's not, it's, it's not something that the, the real benefit over here is that um, the residential. The residential is really, really strong. And as uh, Richard Lobel pointed out, 
this is not really a lot where you have very good frontage for commercial. It's not really, um, like if you look at the development across the street, they have more frontage than depth, which is one reason why people can come out and say, listen, I'm here and get a presence. In a building like this, where most of the presence is in the back on 79th, it would be more of a residential development just as it speaks on its own. And you have other experience with residential development? We do actually mostly residential development. Um, we barely do any commercial. Uh, if there's ever any commercial development that we do, it's always mixed with residential. We've never done just a commercial development. Other questions for Mr. Zerkiev? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Are there any other speakers on this item? There being none, the hearing is closed. Madam Secretary, I want you to think long and hard before you answer this question. <laughs> Is there any other business before the commission today? No, Vice Chair. You are certain? That is my final answer. <laughs> All right, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>